And so I thought that I should talk to you today about um, an inverse problem. It's a, it's a harder than usual inverse problem. And given that my interest is, uh, is in an inverse problem, what I'm trying to do is basically learn some uh, model parameters. So these model parameters have been collated, and that forms uh, the model parameter vector S that I'm trying to learn by inverting the data that I have at hand. And this data, it comprises measurements of uh, the observable I. So um, I have this personal uh, classification scheme, really, when it comes to inverse problems. Uh, I, I tend to think of them as problems of type 1, when uh, the functional relationship between I and S, as expressed here, when this function happens to be known, then I refer to such problems as uh, inverse problems of type 1. I mean, these are easier in the sense that then you can directly invert this, this known function and operate it on I to give you an estimate of S. Uh, then there are inverse problems of type 2, in which uh, this functional relationship between I and S is not known, so you have to basically learn it, and uh, you could, in principle, use uh, a Gaussian process of appropriate dimensions to learn it, uh, or if you are of such inclination, you could use lines and weightlets, uh, hopefully only in lower dimensions. Um, now, use all these methods to fit to what? So to fit, obviously, to training data. And training data here comprises uh, some uh, generated values of the observable i at chosen values of s. So I'm showing those chosen values with the s star uh, notation there. So the idea then is to train a model for this unknown function using such training data. And then, of course, I mean inverting it, uh, <coughs> operating the inverse on i and getting my estimate of s in the process. So of course, here, I mean, the, the underlying assumption is that the inverse exists, so we assign it to compute it. Um, so the, 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 the technical problem that we are often in real life situations faced with is the absence of training data. What do we do when such training data is not uh, accessible? Well, uh, state-based modeling uh, based methodologies, they, they do exist, uh, but of course, I mean, in general, that is even beyond inverse problems of type 2, uh, it has to be said that when we are faced with lack of training data, then we have to reduce our ambition. Uh, so we can't then learn the full correlation structure of this unknown function. And we are reduced to learning values of this function at uh, chosen locations in the support. So basically then uh, you, you, you can start thinking about these values as, uh, as individual parameters that you're trying to learn, given the data. Uh, and parameters that are distribution free, uh, but they are also independent of each other. So you have sacrificed your ambition of learning the correlation structure is basically the underlying uh, theme of such situations. So uh, here again, we are faced with a similar situation. So we are interested in the material density function. Okay, and I show you some examples. So the support of uh, the sort material density function, this is an R3. And the support is spanned by uh, those, those three spatial coordinates, x, y, and z. And of course, here, the, the examples that I show you in these 2D slices, the, the, the slices have been generated at a particular value of one of those spatial coordinates, namely y has been set equal to 0. Uh, OK, so uh, as you can see, that even, sorry, even in this slice, uh, there, are, there are these two things that that, that, that stare you in the face, and that is firstly that uh, the, the material density function can be highly discontinuous, and uh, it can also be characterized by very sharp density contrasts. Okay, and uh, real life examples of material density function, and hopefully I'll have time to cover one such application. Uh, you'll see that that will borrow features from these extreme examples that I show you here. So that will basically it can have uh, like, like, a, like an island, an isolated island at over density in one part of the material sample. And in another part of the sample, there could be these, brand, these, these bands or these striations of, uh, of uh, con contrasting density values. So these, uh, these sort of material density functions are uh, fundamentally difficult to model with Gaussian processes. 
So if I were to, for example, attempt a model using a Gaussian process, then uh, I realize that given how discontinuous the, the density is, I would indeed have to invoke a non-stationary covariance function. Um, now, uh, the, 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 the parameterization of even a stationary covariance function in the presence of training data, it's a computationally hard problem, but it's been done, so it's, it's amply doable. Uh, the, the parameterization of non-stationary covariance functions in the presence of training data is a very difficult problem. And there are some preliminary um, efforts that have been put towards this. Uh, so, for example, there is a work by Pat Shirek, and the attempt there is to construct these, these uh, the, the covariance kernels of this non-stationary covariance function so that on local scales they mimic stationarity. Okay? And this, uh, in the patriarch prescription at least, it has been done uh, under the assumption that the spatial variation of the covariance kernels is smooth. Now we realize that with the kind of real life material density functions that we will be required to model, this uh, smooth spatial variation of the covariance kernels is not going to be necessarily guaranteed. So we are talking about learning such a covariance function, or parameterizing such a covariance function rather, um, in the absence of training data. And that is well nigh impossible. So the first thing that we can do to help ourselves is to then create training data. And one way we can achieve this is basically by doing what I was suggesting before. So you try and and discretize the support, and you learn values of your uh, material density in each of the boxes uh, that, that, that comes out of this discretization. And you hope that this discretization is driven by some feature in your data. So for us, it is driven by the, the resolution of our, of our data. So it's, we, we learn these parameters, but of course we treat them as independent of each other. So we, uh, they thereby generate the training data, which can then be input into a scheme of this nature, uh, which would be an exploratory exercise, I have to say, because this sort of a non-stationary covariance uh, structure would be, it would be a very interesting exercise to try and uh, parameterize that. Right, so uh, what about our data? Let's talk about our data uh, now. Uh, the data is image data that has been recorded with the scanning electron microscope. Okay. So here um, we have, uh, in, in SEMs rather, what is done to image a uh, slab of material, which is shown here in this cuboid, uh, is that you have a beam that is composed of electrons. Okay? And in this cartoon, the beam is shown here in this thick black arrow. So this beam is made incident on the material surface. At different points in the material surface are visited by the beam at successive times. Uh, and when uh, the, the, the electrons, they, they hit the surface, uh, because of the fact that they have some energy in them, they will penetrate into the material uh, bulk, and they will start interacting with the molecules of the material. And as a result of these interactions, the electrons will lose their energy, and they will come to a stop after traveling some distance. And this is, of course, a very loose picture. Uh, so this region then sort of this three-dimensional region inside the bulk of the material then defines the, uh, the, the remit of the electrons in the material uh, bulk. Okay? So this is the region in which all the atomistic interactions between the electrons and the material molecules are happening. So microscopists refer to this region as the interaction volume. So that's the, the bit that's shown here in, in this blue bowl-shaped uh, region. So, uh, and actually, I mean, following microscopy theory, we model in our work, we model the shape of the interaction volume to be a hemisphere, uh, the center of which happens to be the beam location. And in this particular example, let's say that this is the IS beam location. The radius of this interaction volume, see, the radius of the interaction volume is given by uh, how energetic the electrons in the beam are. Okay, so for a more energetic uh, set of electrons, you basically get a bigger interaction volume and so on. So let's say that this particular uh, interaction volume is attained at energy epsilon k. So this then becomes my IKS interaction volume. Okay? So because of those atomistic interactions in this region, there are different kinds of radiations that are generated. And 
and uh, the radiation generated in this bowl per unit volume then becomes proportional to the material density. And this radiation, as it is making its way out of the bulk of the uh, material slab, and is recorded here at the location as the image datum in the, in the IH pixel of the image, uh, the, the radiation gets modulated in quality and, and intensity by different kinds of physical processes. Okay? So the image datum that is recorded is uh, and the, in, in the IH pixel of an image data set generated at a beam energy that is the case of the beam energy. So this, this modulation that I spoke to you about, that is really, uh, mathematically speaking, that would uh, be suggested to be a convolution between the material density, which is proportional to the radiation per unit volume, as I said, uh, so that's rho, the function rho of x, y, and z, and the, 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 some kind of a kernel that em embodies these different physical processes that happen to be modulating my radiation. And that is a kernel function that I represent here as eta, again in general a function of x, y, and z. So it's really the convolution of a rho and eta that is giving rise to my image data. Okay? And it's not just the convolution, but really the, 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 the averaging of this convolution over the volume that is the volume of the interaction uh, volume. And that is what is represented here. So it's the convolution that's just being averaged over that volume. Right, so uh, one way to, to think of this averaging is really by saying that it's a projection of this convolution onto the center of my interaction volume that gives rise to the image data. And it's this projection that is suggested by the operator curly C. But then we realize that the projection onto the center of the hemisphere is itself a composition of three um, orthogonal projections, which are also commutable, by the way. So what we're saying now is that if I want to learn uh, this convolution of my unknown functions, then I have to perform three sequential inversions of uh, my data. Okay? And thereafter, I would then want to learn uh, the, the, the functions rho and eta, or rather their discretized versions, individually. So this requires multiple inversions, which is to be distinguished from the kind of inverse problems that we read about in literature. Um, and there are two further complications that are idiosyncratic of this particular application. One is that uh, inversion that with the aim of three-dimensional density reconstruction, it inevitably requires multiple images. Okay, and a uh, low number of images uh, gives rise to numerically unstable solutions. But in this case, uh, unlike what is the status quo, we cannot achieve different images at different viewing angles, such as the logistic of imaging with SCM. And if you are so interested, we can speak about these details. Um, so that's, that's the first point. And the second point is that, as I said before, the material density function, which we are trying to learn from the data, that's highly discontinuous. The image data itself, uh, uh, it displays a high degree of uh, spatial discontinuity, which means that you cannot invoke status quo to perform this harder than usual inversion. And that status quo happens to be in the form of an inverse random transform. So a random transform is really a, a, a projection of a function that's defined in over Rn uh, onto a hyperplane uh, of a lower dimension, uh, resulting in a function that's defined over Rn. M is less than n, let's say. So uh, the inverse of the random transform is also defined. Uh, the, the problem is, firstly, that it involves a spatial derivative of the data. And uh, as, as I said before, our data is going to be discontinuous. Taking spatial derivatives of such data is going to give rise to numerical instability. The second point is that the, uh, the, the inversion, the inverse random transform, requires this multiple uh, image um, uh, which is uh, to be generated at different viewing angles. And that, of course, is not going to be possible in this application. So we have to do something uh, different, something a little bit more clever. And, one, and these are really the salient features of the solution that, that we propose. The first thing is that we need to expand the amount of data that we have. And how do you do that? So one way of doing that is basically by imaging at different uh, beam energies. 
So for a lower beam energy, you get the information from some depth. Let's say that's indexed by the value k. And at a higher beam energy, you get information from an even lower depth, indexed now by let's say k plus one. So you've got information coming from different subsurface depths. And when you compare such information, you are in a position to learn about the subsurface structure of the material. So that's basically the underlying uh, principle there. Now this is a, a kind of imaging that I believe has never been done with scanning electron microscopes. So I found it extremely difficult explaining to uh, people who do this kind of experiments uh, as to what was required. And uh, it, it wasn't possible. It was at that point that I turned to the material scientist in residence, my collaborator, who's also present in the audience, and details of these imaging techniques we can then, uh, you, you can address to him. So there's uh, Dr. Paul, who's at the, at the back of the room. Um, so th this being the first of our uh, facets of uh, the suggested solution, as I call it, the second important point to take home is this. As I said, we have to discretize the support. So you basically discretize your XYZ uh, that, that spans your material slab, and this discretization is determined by resolution in the data. So it's a data-driven number of um, uh, voxels that you have generated by this discretization, and as many voxels, that many uh, material density parameters that we aim to learn. So in the ith of these boxes, I just call my density parameter to be z, so z ith. And uh, similarly, I should be defining my uh, the, the, the kernel function, or what microscopists refer to as the microscopy correction function. That again should be learned in each of these boxes. But uh, just to make sure that I have um, yeah, identifiability amongst the solutions, I basically set my microscopy correction function to be a function of depth only. And that's not too bad an, uh, an assumption because you know the, the, the whole point is that this, these, these physical processes that modulate uh, the, the radiation as it is coming out from the depth onto the surface, those physical processes occur only in the depth and they should depend, and they should rather be independent of what is the location on the surface. That having been said, a careful microscopist would probably suggest that, well, your microscopy correction function itself should be a function of the material density, which would require, as a, for me as a, as a statistician, to model my microscopy correction function to, to depend on rho, which is, or rather on this, this z, uh, which is the, the notation I'm using for the, uh, the material density parameter. That, of course, would give rise to a difficult model, uh, and my model is much simpler. So I'm considering my microscopy correction parameters to be independent of Z, okay? Um, right, so uh, the, the other thing that we also include is uh, priors that track the sparsity in the material density function. So how do we do that? Well, the idea is that if you've got a, a smaller bowl embedded inside a bigger bowl, so these are the interaction volumes that have been attained at a smaller and higher energy. So it, it, you would expect that the projection from the smaller bowl onto the center of that bowl, onto the center of the hemisphere, that projection is going to be in general smaller than the projection that you get from uh, the bigger bowl onto the center, onto the same center. Now this would be true uh, unless the density in the, in the intervening voxels happens to be zero or very low. Okay, so what, what we're saying is we're recasting this probabilistic statement by introducing the notation tau. So tau is giving me the ratio of the projections from the, the, the interaction volume that is attained at a higher energy, that's the bit in the numerator, and the interaction volume that's attained at the lower energy. Okay, and uh, I'm now saying that if tau happens to be less than one, then it's probably true that the density uh, z in the relevant intervening voxel is very low or zero. And it's true with some probability mu, which is a function of tau. Okay? So this mu is, this probability is modeled as a monotonic one parameter function of tau, uh, with the hyperparameter there being p. Um, p basically controls the, the degree of nonlinearity in the 
the response of nu on tau. So higher the p, uh, the, the, the more is the nonlinearity. Right, so uh, we just impose a, a simple uniform hyperprior on p. The, the, the interval uh, that I cite here, this is experiment to um, contribute uh, into it. Right, so the prior on the density is then given in terms of this function nu. And the prior is suggested to have what would be a, a half normal looking distribution. Right, so here is a simple simulation study to uh, show you the efficiency of this prior, to show that this prior tracks sparsity in the density properly. So here are two examples of simulated densities, one there and one there. And these have been, these are the densities, true densities, in voxels that are stacked one on top of each other. So the depth of, uh, of each of these voxels is basically uh, presented here in this <coughs> index K. So the density is plotted with respect to this, uh, this depth index or energy index K. So you see that the, for this density, uh, the, the prior that I get where it is of this nature. And this prior is, it reflects higher degree of sparsity uh, than in this, which is what you'd expect. And of course, the efficiency in the prior to track sparsity becomes clearer if I plot my prior against K, against the depth index K. And this seems to do a, a good enough job in the Right, so uh, that was about the prize on the density, and I, haven't, I don't have it written down in the slides, but just to let you know that the prize on the, the microscopy correction function, those have been elicited from literature. And uh, given that sometimes we have, uh, a, or rather not we, but microscopists sometimes seem to have more information about how this correction function should be, um, and sometimes they don't. So we have basically developed two sets of models. One is a well-informed model, and the other set of models are not that well-informed. So you've got two sets of, uh, two kinds of priors uh, that uh, would be used on the other set of parameters that we are trying to learn. Uh, right, so as far as the, the likelihood is concerned, that is written, as you can see, in terms of this including distance between the image data, that's the, the I with the tilde on top, and uh, the projection that you get from these interaction volumes. And the shape of the likelihood is Gaussian. Uh, the prize I've, I've spoken to you about, so that gives rise to our posterior probability density. And this is a very interesting inference problem. But really, I mean, I would need another 25 minutes to do justice to the inference part of it, as I did to the modeling side of it. So I've skipped the inference altogether. But I'll just let you know that what we did here was uh, um, the metropolis within Gibbs, basically. Uh, and we used adaptive metropolis, which was spoken of in the last talk in this room. And yes, I mean, the, the, there are three, state, three classes of resolution that um, are defined by how the size of the voxel that, that compares to the size of the interaction volume, which uh, is uh, it, it's an inherent quality of a particular material. Okay. So depending on how this comparison pans out, we have three classes of models. Right. So there are some important results. Firstly, we realize that if we are in the small noise limit, then uh, this convolution of the unknowns, uh, unknown functions, that happens to be a solution of the least squares problem, which is not um, surprising. The, 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 the reassuring thing is that uh, had we acknowledged uh, noise in the, the image data, which of course we have to, in that case, the maximal deviation from uniqueness in this, um, uh, this convolution would be basically set by the noise of the data, which is about 5% at most for these SEM images. But of course, we are doing everything within a Bayesian framework, and this was more to sort of satisfy a referee. Um, so in, in our Bayesian framework, we, I, I will show you the results that uh, the, 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 the credible regions, the 95% highest probability density regions, will accompany our um, parameter estimation. Okay, so this is just to draw your attention to one uh, real life uh, application that we have done. So we had a nano composite that was grown by my collaborator, and again, you can address your uh, technical questions if there are any to him. So there was this brick that was made out of uh, nanoparticles of silver and nickel, and it was imaged at 11 different energies, uh, beam energies, that is, 
And here I show you two images that were taken with an SEM uh, of this uh, nanocomposite at the lowest of those 11 energies and the highest of the 11 energies. And uh, I just, uh, it, it, now if I try to invert the data in these images uh, in, in one MCMC chain, that would just involve two d parameters. So what I did was I basically uh, divided these images up into squares like this colorized square that you see here and basically inverted each of them at a node, at a different node of, uh, of a cluster. So about 16 of them would, would accommodate this, uh, this image. So uh, the, the inset basically is, uh, it, it draws your attention to how the image data in that colorized square pans out. So I'm going to show you results from two such um, independent bits or independent parts of the image data. One is what is shown with these squares, and the other part was somewhere over there. Now, you, we recall that we are treating our parameters as independent. So this is not something, I'm not, I'm not uh, prohibited from, from doing this, from the part, this kind of a simple, nice partitioning. Okay. So uh, when I inverted the data from this part, which I call my part A of the image data, then uh, the material density that I learned uh, is shown in this panel here. This again is the material density in the 2D slice generated at y equal to zero. Uh, and you can see that you, you do find some isolated islands of over density and then there are other uh, areas on the, in the material sample where the, there is a more continuous stretch of density deposition. And then there was the other part which was not there, not marked in the red color I square. And when I inverted the data from that, the material density that I learned in that same similar 2D slice is shown here. Now, uh, the, the, these, these were the material density parameters. Now, as far as the, uh, the, the microscopy correction function or the correction parameters are concerned, well, we would expect that given our uh, modeling, given our assumption, that this correction function is independent of our x and y coordinates, it depends only on the depth coordinate, you would expect that by inverting the data from the two parts, whatever you learn for the microscopy correction function, that must, they must agree with each other, right? Because that depends only on the depth. And those, uh, the, the two parts in my image data, which were here and there, those two parts uh, were different only in terms of, of their x and y coordinates. So when I look at the learned uh, microscopy correction parameters, uh, and I plot them from the two parts in red and black, they do indeed overlap. And those error bars are the 95% HPP. Okay, so uh, before I, I wrap up, I just wanted to run some MCMC diagnostics past you. So here is the trace of the likelihood. And uh, so here I've got histograms that were generated for different parameters um, between the, uh, the 80,000 and the 810000 iteration. That histogram is shown in black, and the histogram in red was generated using the value of the parameter uh, between the 70,000 and the 710000 uh, iteration. And those histograms are shown for uh, a material, uh, sorry, this is a, um, a, a microscopy correction parameter and one for a material density parameter, and here is the histogram for the light field. Okay. So uh, I'll just wrap up with conclusions. I, I've tried to talk to you today about a harder than usual inverse problem, which was a prediction problem. So, the, 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 well, at least as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the modeling aspect was easier than with, so for example, the problem that I spoke to you about in the last event, which was an inverse problem of type two. Okay, so uh, one of the things that we were quite happy with is this, the prior that we developed on sparsity. Um, and uh, the results in the low noise limit they were explored, and it was a nice inference problem using Metropolis Hastings. Thank you.